My name is Keen Lucas. I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University, advised by Leo Bauer. Uh, and today I'll be talking about how to make machine learning based uh, raw binary malware detectors more robust to evasion attacks. So I'm sure this isn't going to come as a surprise to anyone in this room, but malware is a problem. Uh, a report from PurpleSec noted that small businesses and companies attacked by malware uh, can reach costs of uh, millions of dollars, and the global cost of cybercrime is uh, estimated to be in the trillions. Uh, for these reasons and more, uh, detecting malware is an especially important uh, endeavor. As one of the many tools used to detect malware, deep neural nets, or DNNs, uh, have been found to be promising and increasingly used, uh, as we've heard in the previous talks. Uh, what we mean is that a DNN can look at the uh, compiled bytes of binary, such as an exe or file or other executable, and then output a prediction on whether it is benign or malicious. Uh, in this process, a DNN has been found to be around 98% accurate on unseen binaries. Uh, however, like in the image domain, machine learning algorithms uh, can be fooled by just slightly perturbing the input. Uh, in these cases, the input looks the same to us, but the otherwise accurate classifier gets it wrong. Uh, these inputs are referred to as an adversarial example. Uh, in the malware domain, what this means is that you could have a piece of malware that is correctly classified by a deep neural network. Uh, unfortunately, by applying some targeted perturbations meant to uh, evade the detector, uh, we can make it so this classifier no longer detects the malware and classifies it as benign. Uh, this is an issue. So to fix this and make these detectors more reliable, the objective of this work is to defend against these attacks. First, uh, we'll go into more details on the type of attacks that exist and then to our work in defending against them. Creating an adversarial example like this in the malware domain has its own unique constraints uh, compared to the image domain. For example, the changes made to a binary must preserve the same functionality. Uh, if you change the wrong bytes, then you could uh, make the binary crash. It may no longer be a valid binary, or if it doesn't crash, it may no longer be malware. Uh, there have been a few attacks already proposed that satisfy these constraints, and we will go through some of them now. Uh, the first attack we'll talk about is called IPR, or in-place replacement. The idea behind this attack is that you have these compiled instructions, and you just want to manipulate them in such a way where uh, the end result is the same thing, uh, but the bytes are different. An example of this could be like changing a add six instruction to a subtract negative six instruction. Uh, these attacks work on around 30% of the binaries they're applied on. Uh, the displacement attack, or disp attack, works by displacing instructions to the end of the binary and then connecting the instruction flow with jump instructions. That leaves you a gap that you can then fill with uh, no-op instructions that don't do anything but are evasive towards the targeted classifier. This works on around 90% of the binaries. Finally, we'll talk about the Kroik attack, uh, which was proposed by Kroik and collaborators. Uh, this attack is pretty fast and doesn't work on the executable bytes at all. Uh, instead, it appends uh, evasive bytes to the end of the binary where they won't be executed. And this attack also works on around 90% of binaries. Uh, another aspect about these attacks we need to talk about is their cost. Uh, displacement and IPR attacks are expensive. Uh, this is because these transformations need to be uh, calculated individually for every part of the binary. Um, this picture on the right, or, yeah, on the right, uh, shows a binary being transformed. And each successive iteration of going through it, you can see that more bytes are being changed. Uh, this also allows us to increasingly make uh, the binary appear more malicious to the uh, targeted detector. Uh, it can take many iterations to successfully evade a detector. Uh, the original published IPR and disp attacks allow up to 200 iterations. Uh, and some transformations, depending on the binary, uh, can be very computationally hard and time consuming to, to finish. Uh, overall, an IPR attack takes about an hour to create. Uh, a disp attack takes around five minutes, and a croak attack takes around five seconds. Uh, so now that we've introduced some attacks and uh, discussed their computational attacks or costs, uh, this uh, will become soon relevant as we talk about how to defend against these objects these attacks, which is the objective of this paper. Uh, so we and others have tried uh, a, a few different potential defenses, but in general, they haven't worked out. So the point of this paper is to try adversarial training in this domain. Uh, adversarial training works by using evasive binaries as training data and to try to teach the classifier to stop being fooled by these attacks. Uh, adversarial training in the raw binary domain presents its own unique, unique difficulties. Uh, it requires around tens of thousands of adversarial examples, and as we just mentioned, some of these attacks can take around an hour each to create. Um, with these timings, training just one adversarial training run on a single uh, server could take around a decade to complete. 
Uh, also, we don't want to just train one adversarial example or adversarial uh, training model. We want to explore the different configurations of adversarial training uh, to see how the resultant robustness is affected. Uh, other configurations can include uh, training with different types of attacks, optimizing the different attacks different numbers of times that we train on, uh, how many batches we train with, and how many bytes we insert into a binary to make it evasive, also known as a displacement budget. Uh, this brings us to the main contributions of the work. Uh, which is to how to overcome these challenges uh, and see if adversarial training works for raw binary detectors, and if it does, uh, what configuration works the best. Uh, so one of the things we do to overcome the computational challenges we parallelize. Uh, we create the adversarial examples around over 13 servers using around 150 different worker processes. Uh, we then send all these adversarial examples to a centralized training process. Unfortunately, even with this, training was still taking far too long. Uh, for this reason, we spent a lot of time optimizing code uh, and making it faster in fixed cases where uh, it could take too much memory. Uh, we also decided not to try training with, uh, we decided to try training with attacks that had not been fully optimized and so may not be as evasive as the original attacks, but could be completed much, much faster. Uh, many of these cheaper attacks actually may not even be able to fool the detector that we train with, but we did see that we still got a robustness gain, um, which we'll talk about later. Uh, overall, by combining all these optimizations together, we were able to get training down to a matter of weeks uh, and start conducting experiments. In these experiments, we had a few questions we wanted to answer. Uh, the first question is, does adversarial training work in the raw binary detection domain? And if it does, can we train with these less optimized attacks and still be robust to the more optimized original attacks? Uh, we also wanted to see if, if adversarial training worked with some of these attacks, all of them, or just some. Uh, so now we'll talk about the results. Uh, in this plot, uh, the y-axis denotes the amount of attack success we have, and the x-axis denotes uh, how much training we've done so far, measured in numbers of batches of adversarial examples we've trained on. Uh, in this plot, a curve going down and to the right uh, would represent a uh, successful adversarial training run where we are decreasing the attack success. Uh, in contrast, a flatter line would represent uh, a training run that's not working as the success is not going down as we train. Uh, so with this in mind, let's answer the first question, does adversarial training work? Yeah, it does. Great, adversarial training work, do, adversarial training does work on raw binary malware detectors. Uh, this plot shows that with adversarial training, or before adversarial training, we have about a 90% attack success rate, but after training on 55,000 batches of adversarial examples, uh, the attack success rate for displacement attacks goes down to 14%. Uh, similarly, uh, this plot shows a reduction of IPR attack success from 26 to 10% when we train on IPR attacks, uh, and a similar reduction in Kroik attack success from 84 to 30% as we train on Kroik attacks. So this is good, adversarial training works. Uh, as a side note, another trend we noticed, and you may have noticed, is that we get most of this robustness within the first 10,000 batches, so why not just stop there? Um, so this is explored more in the paper, but the short answer is we can't stop there because we lose a lot of uh, accuracy on the original non-adversarial binaries, and to regain that, we needed to keep on training. Uh, we also wanted to see if we can train with lower iteration or faster attacks and still be robust to the original, more expensive attacks. Uh, as a quick reminder, we needed to do this because even though we've parallelized and optimized code, it still takes a long time, so any kind of uh, speed we can get from uh, optimizing these training attacks less is a win. Uh, we decided to train with attacks that had only been executed for one to 10 iterations as compared to the full 200 iterations of the original attacks. Uh, we also found that this worked, uh, but we do lose some robustness that is worth discussing. Uh, this plot shows adversarial training with displacement attacks, uh, and these lines represent attacks that are optimized for all the way up to 200 iterations. Uh, but the top dotted line represents an adversarial training run that only uses attacks optimized for one iteration, which as shown as the dotted lines sloping down to the right shape, uh, significantly reduces the attack success of these 200 iteration attacks. Uh, the plot also shows that if we train with attacks optimized for 10 iterations, represented by the solid line on the bottom there, uh, we do get more robust model, uh, but we gain the majority of the robustness by using only one iteration attacks. Uh, this is promising news showing that we can train with less optimized attacks and make our models more robust to uh, more optimized attacks. 
Uh, the same trend holds for IPR, where 200 iteration IPR attacks are less successful after training with IPR attacks only optimized between one and 10 iterations. Uh, in contrast, we're able to train with fully optimized 200 iteration croak attacks as they are fast enough that there is no need to train on less optimized attacks. Uh, this is also good. So far, we've shown that adversarial training works when we train on the same type of attack that we evaluate with. Uh, in the paper, we go into more detail on this and explore other aspects of training, such as attack uh, budget and data augmentation. But as the final result we'll discuss uh, in this presentation, I will talk about how adversarial training works in the malware detection domain if we train with one type of attack and evaluate with a different type of attack. Uh, the answer to this question is a little bit more mixed. Uh, for example, this plot shows the success of IPR and quick attacks after training on displacement adversarial examples. According to these curves, uh, we do get a reduced, a, the attack success of IPR and quick attacks does reduce, uh, albeit much less of an extent as uh, the displacement attacks. Uh, on the other hand, training with IPR attacks does not seem to defend against displacement and croic attacks. Uh, so in conclusion, training on DISP uh, does help with IPR and croic, but IPR, training with IPR does not help with the other attacks. Uh, unfortunately, these are the last results we have time to discuss today. In the paper, we explore the robustness effects of training with croic on other attacks, uh, several more aspects of adversarial training in the raw binary malware detection domain. Uh, and also achieve some success in getting robustness through a much easier to produce data augmentation. Uh, please read our paper to get the details. For now, we'll wrap up. Uh, at, well, <laughs> as I previously talked about, malware is a huge issue, and ML-based raw binary malware detectors can be a great tool in helping against the fight against it. Unfortunately, these detectors have been showed that they can be fooled. Um, adversarial training was a promising way to increase the robustness, but uh, this was previously computationally infeasible. In our work, we've shown that with some engineering and use of cheaper attacks, uh, adversarial training can make malware detectors more robust to raw binary attacks. Uh, the paper can, code can be seen at this URL. Thank you for your time, and please let me know if you have any questions.